The final phase of the Denver Broncos offseason begins today as mandatory minicamp kicks off. What are some of the offense and defensive storylines that you as Broncos country need to pay attention to leading up to training camp? We cover that and much more in today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome back into a brand new episode of Lockdown Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast here on the Lockdown NFL Network, your team every day from the South Stands to the end zone. I'm your host, as always, Cody Rourke, senior Broncos analyst at Mile High Sports, joined alongside by my co-host, Sarah Bettinger. He's a site expert, predominantly orange.com. We also cover the Broncos for the Lockdown Network and I News. Broncos country, once again, thank you so much for making Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day. It goes perfectly with your morning cup of coffee, your morning workout, your morning commute. So thank you for making Lockdown Broncos your first listen every single day. Sarah, the Broncos' final portion of the offseason program begins today. Three days of work with mandatory minicamp today, tomorrow, and Wednesday at the UC Health Training Center. And then the players are off setting the table for training camp. And a lot of the storylines we're going to be talking about today are going to be storylines that will be ongoing throughout once we get to training camp through the preseason and even leading up to the regular season, my man. That's right. So, I mean, a lot of NFL fans, they talk about the dog days of the offseason. We haven't even got there yet, Cody. I mean, we're about to have this five-week stretch right here where you and I, this is where we get to step up our game and bring the people the content daily when there's nothing happening. That's where that's where the cream rises to the top. So that's why you got to keep listening to Locked On Broncos. But man, it's going to be cool to see the the team out there once more, at least before this break, right? I mean, we know that there's a couple guys that have been out injured. There's also some players that, you know, they're just kind of keeping, they're just kind of being cautious with these guys. But at the same time, no contact for this, this period of OT. We won't get that until training camp, but still, I think we're going to get some fun highlights. We're going to get some, you know, some bombs from Russell Wilson posted from the Broncos Twitter account, I'm sure. And it's going to be, it's, it's just more football. It's one step closer, one day closer to the actual NFL season starting and really getting into the thick of it. This is the last hurdle to clear before really we're back into football season. And once training camp starts and we got to, uh, five, six, seven months stretch there where it's all football every day. Ah, we're into the thick of it, as you mentioned. Our Broncos country is excited because they're just about six to seven weeks away from being on the berm in Dove Valley, which, hey, I'm excited for for them as well. And I can't wait to interact with a lot of Broncos fans out there at training camp here this upcoming summer. Uh, you know, some storylines to watch before we get into some of the rules of mandatory minicamp. What's different from organized team activities is that keeping an eye on injured players. Now, last week, Jerry Judy aggravated his groin, as Nathaniel Hackett had mentioned, saying that they were precautionary with him initially when it had happened and they'll have to wait and see whether or not he'll participate so as of right now like today we have no idea whether or not jerry judy will or will not participate in today's uh mandatory mini camp he will be there but will he participate is another question which i think is something that if you're the broncos and if you're jerry judy right now you have to ask the question sarah if jerry feels like it's gonna bother him a little bit is it worth him going out there running routes cutting doing some of the same stuff he's been doing in organized team activities in my opinion I don't feel like there's there's value in him going out there and potentially making it worse, right? Because then all of a sudden, then you enter training camp and maybe you're down one of your top receivers. I think that at this point in time, it's good to give him some rest leading up to training camp. But then again, we'll see how his uh, how his body feels here today. So there is that. No Randy Gregory to you know he will be there, but he will not physically participate, and we'll wait to see what his status will be for training camp there. But outside, of that, I think a lot of people want to know what's the difference between organized team activities and mandatory minicamp. Well, organized team activities. They're all voluntary. Mandatory minicamp, there's the word for you. It's mandatory. Every player is expected to be there, and players can be fined if they are not there. Even injured players will be there. They'll just be viewing. We call it getting mental reps there. But nothing will change outside of what they've been doing at organized team activity. So you're going to see the seven-on-seven. Seven. You're going to see the nine-on-seven seven periods with the offense against the defense. And then you're going to have the 11-on-11 11 11, uh, periods there. As you mentioned earlier, Sarah, no contact is permitted. And the Broncos have done a pretty good job of avoiding this. Now, I would say some other NFL teams across the league have not. The Chicago Bears have messed up with this. They had a can uh, practice canceled uh, because of the fact that they had some live contact 
attacked and, you know, not a good start in the Ryan Poles era over there, by the way. And then you had a situation with the Washington Commanders where one of the defensive players blasted an offensive player and it absolutely pissed off Riverboat Ron. And he laid into the team like you can't have these contact periods when non-contact is permitted here at this point. So. Uh, we'll see if the Broncos are very compliant with it. They have a, you know, the people that are assigned, Sarah, into making sure that the team is compliant in all their offseason workouts and all the on-field activities. So I'm not necessarily worried about that. But I think the important thing, installation is going to continue here. The Broncos offense continues to install their new playbook, the hybrid model between Russ and Nathaniel Hackett. The defensive install is continuing, and obviously special teams work is getting involved. So exciting times ahead, I think, for everybody here in Broncos country. But – Broncos country coming up here in just a moment. Sarah Benninger, myself, we're going to get to the details as to what you're looking forward to seeing on the offensive side of the ball. I'm going to share a storyline of mine that I'm looking forward to watching throughout mandatory minicamp and training camp. Sarah's going to share one of his on the offensive side. We're going to get to that coming up here in just a moment. But before we do that, let me tell you about the sponsor of today's episode of the show. It's good friends over there at Blue Nile. And whether you're ready to pop the question or you're celebrating a milestone moment, you can find jewelry that's as unique as her with modern convenience of online shopping at Blue Nile. Dot com. If you're looking for fine jewelry, but you're having trouble choosing, BlueNile.com has jewelry experts on hand 24-7, available via phone or chat to help you find a memorable gift at every budget. So you can make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. And Locked On Sports listeners, they get $50 off of purchases of $500 or more. And this podcast exclusive includes engagement. So use code Locked On. That's code Locked On. Plus, every single order ships free, as is insured, and it also arrives in discount packaging so it doesn't give away what's inside shop stress free and find your forever peace go to blue nile.com today once again broncos country thank you so much for making lockdown broncos your first listen of the day every single day make it part of your morning routine with a cup of coffee or your breakfast or getting ready for work or your drive to work we appreciate you so much for rocking with us here free and available everywhere you get your podcast and audio format or whether you are watching us on YouTube. Don't forget to check out our guys over the Lockdown Avalanche podcast as the Stanley Cup Finals begin this week. The Tampa Bay Lightning and the Colorado Avalanche will battle on Wednesday at Ball Arena. Check out Lockdown Avalanche for more to preview the big-time matchup. Can the Avs bring home a Stanley Cup trophy? We're excited for it here at the Lockdown Broncos podcast. Sarah, getting into our mandatory minicamp storylines, focusing first on the offensive side of the ball here for the Denver Broncos, I felt like there are so many. I mean, we could literally go probably at every single position of the offensive side of the ball for the Broncos and find a storyline to kind of pull out there and say, Hey, let's highlight this. But I feel like it would be easier. What am I looking forward to? What are you looking forward to? So Sarah, I'm going to start it off with you. What is a storyline that you yourself are looking forward to following here throughout mandatory mini camp and through training camp this upcoming season? Well, I got to go with my favorite position group personally on, on an NFL or football roster in general, the wide receiver position, I absolutely love pass catchers, Cody. I love, I've always have always been drawn to it from when I was a kid, Rod Smith, Randy Moss, all those guys in the nineties that were just so much fun to watch. And growing up, you know, Peter Warwick used to be one of my favorite players. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out for him. But here with the Denver Broncos in 2022, I feel like we've got some fascinating players at this position, right? Like you mentioned, Jerry Judy in the first segment. I mean, what's going to happen with him over the course of these next couple of weeks? My guess is take it easy and, and, you know, don't risk anything because I'm sure they're going to have some throwing sessions out at Russell Wilson's place in San Diego and those type of things. And so he doesn't need to worry about, he can just get those mental reps. Like you talked about KJ Hamler, obviously looking very good coming back from that injury, Tim Patrick, Cortland Sutton. We know what those two guys can bring to the table, but what about behind those four guys, right? That's the fascinating that's the fascinating thing about this position group, I think, going into this break. Uh, who's going to get the reps at the mandatory OTAs if Jerry Judy doesn't get reps? You know, is it going to be Kendall Hinton out there? We saw him make some big plays last year, specifically against teams like the Dallas Cowboys. And it was it was great to see him kind of break through a little bit, kind of become the player that the Broncos hoped he could be. So I think, you know, that's the position group that I'm going to be looking for. Travis Fulgham, he's been building up some hype this offseason. Can he continue to build on that hype? There's so many other guys. Montrell Washington, you got, un I saw undrafted free agent Jalen Virgil making plays in one of the most recent uh, highlights the Broncos put out there. So it's just a, a, a ton of players at this position group that I think could make an impact this coming season. It's just how are they going to who are we going to see in the highlight reel catching those passes 
from Russell Wilson. That's what I'm fascinated to see because I think that'll give us a little hint on what to expect come training camp at the wide receiver position. A little hint in. Yeah, I had to throw that yeah, in there for you there. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, like I said, I and I agree with you too. I think this is the perfect opportunity for the coaching staff. You know, what what would happen if Jerry Judy was not able to participate, right? Who could be his backup, right? We talk about the reemergence of KJ Hamler. No, we're not worried about KJ. We're not worried about Timmy P. We're not worried about Corlin. We're really not worried about Jerry. But you want to figure out if something were to happen to Corlin, the Broncos would just move Tim Patrick to that position. If something were to happen to Tim Patrick, you'd probably see the emergence of a guy like Fulgham elevating up to that role, that specific role that they have there. Uh, for Jerry Judy, it's like, okay, hey, out of 11 personnel, like who replaces him? Is it going to, would it be a guy like KJ Hamler? Possibly there, but you have to see the other work. And I think this is the perfect opportunity for the guys that you mentioned the Montreal Washington's the Jalen Virgil's the undrafted guys who have the opportunity to maybe impress the coaching staff but even also looking back and maybe seeing who might be that underdog guy who might be that wild card that maybe we didn't even expect to step up and make that for you know make a role make a name for himself and like I said you've mentioned it so many times here on the show Russell Wilson's been name dropping Kendall Hinton left and right in various press conferences so I like the optics of Hinton maybe trying to secure that final wide receiver spot on the 53-man roster. But for me, Sarah, I, I think my storyline that I'm going to focus on here, we've heard Nathaniel Hackett allude to it a little bit this offseason for the Denver Broncos that, hey, they could embrace a by-committee approach. So, Sarah, this is operate on the hypothetical of if the Broncos are going to utilize a by-committee approach. It may not be with just two backs. Like, we expect Javante to be the premier guy. Melvin, he's making his first-time appearance at the facility, in the practice facility, since – being re-signed. He's been there for the team photos and obviously some of the promotional social media stuff that they've been doing, but this is his first practice back on the field since re-signing with the Broncos. So like for him, he's going to be the guy behind Javante. What's going to happen with that third running back? Because I, I don't think that Denver's going to go into the season with just two running backs on the roster. I think they're going to go in with three on the active. So really it's kind of up in the air right now. There's Tyreek McAllister, who's an undrafted rookie guy there, but then you also look at guys like Demaria Crockett and you look at Mike Boone, I think these two guys will be competing for that third and final spot on the roster. The question is who can separate themselves. And I tell you what, don't sleep on Demaria Crockett. For me, I do believe that you need a multitude of backs who can step up. And as we saw, like when Melvin Gordon was banged up or Javante was banged up a little bit, we got to see a little bit of Mike Boone. Now, granted, it's a small sample size and the small sample size was impressive, but I don't know if it's necessarily enough data that this coaching staff can come into mandatory mini camp and training camp say, okay, hey, based on what we saw from him against the Kansas City Chiefs last year, Mike Boone is going to be the number three back. I think right now that competition between those two guys is wide open and it begins even further here, mandatory mini camp. And it's going to be something that carries out through preseason here, Sarah. So for me, I think that's probably one of the more pertinent things that I got my eye on here. And then we can even talk about the offensive line. We'll probably focus on that on tomorrow because I know that's going to be a big subject of discussion on tomorrow's episode, Locked On Broncos. But, you know, your thoughts on the running backs there, but, you know, the number three option, be, you know, behind Melvin and behind Javante. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Demaria Crockett because I, you know, I'm not trying to read too much into these highlight videos the Broncos are posting, but I did notice Demaria Crockett was one of the guys that caught a pass from Russell Wilson in a Broncos highlight reel that they posted, which I don't think is nothing, right? I, I think that you're getting a guy out there to see that to me would indicate that maybe is he the running back two behind Javante Williams as of right now? That wouldn't surprise me based on the fact we saw more of him, even if it was on special teams last year than we did Mike Boone. Plus, you know, there's the financial aspect of that. And I also think, you know, just digging more into Demaria Crockett and his his pre-draft metrics, you know, just the way that he uh, the way that he came out of Missouri with just a, a big stocky build, like a traditional running back in the wide zone offense. But not only that, he's explosive. He's got some pretty dang good speed and he has a little bit of experience with this coaching staff. Cody, we talk all about just the connections that some of these players have to the coaches on the staff. Demaria Crockett was once a member of the Green Bay Packers with Nathaniel Hackett as their offensive coordinator. So, I, I mean, it's it's all about who you know and this, these yeah. five degrees or three degrees of separation or whatever it is. But in the NFL, those kinds of things can really matter. So you get a guy like we've mentioned, Travis Fulgham has those connections as well, or Demaria Crockett who comes into camp and all of a sudden Nathaniel Hackett and Justin Allen, they're like, wow, we had that guy in Green Bay. He looks really good now. He looks really explosive. He looks like he's grown a lot. He looks like he's got a lot better. And he has some familiarity with the system. 
I could definitely see that being a thing. And especially because in the wide zone offense, how many times did we see in the Mike Shanahan era and the Gary Kubiak, uh, you, pu you put a running back out there, they could basically just walk to a thousand yards, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> It's all about having patience. It's all about reading those blocks. And it's all about making one cut and getting upfield. Demaria Crockett is a 220 pound back with four or five speed and big time explosiveness who can get upfield in a hurry. And I think in the wide zone type of offense, he could have a lot of success. So I'm I'm with you on Demaria Crockett. I'm I'm on this train. I know it's he might just be the third running back on the depth chart, but that kind of depth can really make a difference over the course of a season. When he's been there all offseason, too, especially with organized team activities, like he's been on the field when Melvin Gordon simply has it. And look, nothing against Melvin Gordon, but I'm saying like missing out on those reps in a brand new offense, Sarah, I mean, it makes a world of difference, I think, when you get to training camp and you got young guys behind you who are chomping at the bit, and especially for like Melvin's on a one year deal. Like we've seen more shocking things happening in the NFL. Like, what if the Broncos were to release him? What if they were to look to trade him for the season? Like, anything is possible at this point here. But who knows? Who knows how it'll go here for this Denver Broncos team, especially at the beginning part of mandatory minicamp. No contact, as we've mentioned. But these storylines are things that will fester and build throughout the training camp process and throughout preseason, right before decisions are made or roster cuts before the regular season begins. Broncos country, Broncos football is almost back. But coming up here in just a moment, we're going to talk about the Broncos defensive storylines to watch including the edge rusher rotation could Nick Benito work his way in with the first team that's something we discuss we debate we ponder and much more coming up here in just a moment but before we do that let me tell you about betonline.net the sponsor of today's episode lockdown Broncos and betonline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports information you can find all the latest sports developments news and odds including this year's basketball championship matchup the NHL hockey conference finals not to mention major league baseball and of course all things with the latest fighting news of the mma and ufc plus boxing is included in that as well bet online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information including live betting esports and more so head to the website today use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in the action bet online where the game starts <laughs> As we jump into the fourth quarter action on today's episode, Lockdown Broncos. Once again, Broncos country, thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of the show. We're available on every podcasting provider, not to mention you can watch us on YouTube, on your phone, on your computer, or on your television. You can interact with us on Twitter, at Cody Rourke NFL, at Sarah Bettinger, at Lockdown Broncos. We always look forward to the interaction we get on YouTube as well from everybody in Broncos country. Now, shifting our thoughts here to the defensive storylines to watch for Broncos mandatory minicamp this week. So I'm going to start things off with a guy that we've talked about a lot, and we heard from Patrick Sertan last week who had a lot of high praise about Michael Ojemudia and the plays that he's been making, which kind of made me think, okay, hey, could we potentially see Michael Ojemudia get reps with the Broncos' first-team defense when they go with their dime look. Now, it has been rumored that they're going to be looking to play a little bit more of an even front out of the dime package this season. Well, Cody, what does that entail? Even means that there's a, an even number of down linemen on the defensive front there. So keep an eye on that. So that would mean that the Broncos would be running four down linemen. So ideally, you'd probably factor in a defensive tackle. Could be two defensive ends and two outside linebackers. The Broncos have all the different options that they could work with. One inside linebacker. And then six defensive backs, your two outside guys, your two safeties, and your two slot defenders, who we believe that if the Broncos are going to be playing a lot of dimes there, maybe kind of begs the question, are they looking for guys inside the slot that can play against the run, be that extra help, especially if you have a four down line in front there, you can have extra protection on the edge with those guys playing inside the nickel and or the dime, we call it the slot there. I mean, that's an interesting thing there. And can Michael Ojemudi potentially take one of those positions? I think he can, right? I mean, that's exactly what we've been hoping for. We've been hoping to see some of this versatility from the whole defensive backfield. I mean, there's been talk of, and not from the Broncos end specifically, but talk of like Caden Stearns playing a little bit of cornerback or Pastor Tan moving in and playing dime or playing nickel and, and Ojemudia doing kind of similar things. Damari Mathis, is he going to make his initial impact with the Denver Broncos roster as a nickel defensive back? I think that whole secondary is going to be fun to watch just for these, just for the moving parts. I'm fascinated to see if OJ Moody plays on the outside. Does Kareem Jackson, you know, come crash down and Caden Stearns play deep or it's going to be a fun group to watch because right now fully healthy, the Broncos are pretty loaded back there, at least Mary. on paper. They've got a lot of really intriguing players with some very differing skill sets. I mean, it's, it's a pretty diverse group back there just in terms of, 
what this guy and what that guy is really good at. And we know Michael Ojemudia, this dude can hit. He might have the worst luck of any defensive <laughs> back on the team right now in terms of picking off passes, it, dating back to his very first NFL game. Remember that sick interception he had against the Tennessee oh, Titans? Man. That was nullified Stupid by a just Stupid penalty. Just a bogus. I, it, it shouldn't have been called. That was a bad penalty. They called it on Alexander Johnson. But yeah, no, that was a great play by OJ. That was trash. That was absolute. That that one was robbed from OJ, but it did kind of set the tone for a bit of unlucky breaks, you know, a streak of unlucky breaks. But at the same time, he set a Broncos rookie record, Cody, in 2020 with four forced fumbles. So he kind of made up for it in a way. And he's capable of jarring that ball out. He's not afraid to go hit somebody never has dating back to his time at Iowa. So I like that idea. I like what that potential, you know, just that group could bring to the table. There's so many different options out there. And I think the same is true at the edge position, which is the the area that I'm really looking for at this, at this OTA session, right? We, we know Randy Gregory, they're going to be cautious with him. They're going to make sure he's fully recovered from that shoulder surgery, that procedure that he had before putting him out there on the field, which I think is a good idea. And then obviously you got Jonathan Cooper, who, who probably won't be out there till training camp as yeah. well with the, the surgery on his finger. So I think that what are we going to see at this position group? This is going to be really interesting because there's not enough roster spots, at least in my eyes, I, I guess I don't know how they're going to construct the roster, but the, I don't think there's enough roster spots right now for the amount of guys that they actually have. Like we talk about this edge position group and obviously Bradley Chubb, Randy Gregory, they're the assumed starters out there. And then you've got Malik Reed. You've got first round or for our top draft pick, Nick Benito, and you've got Baron Browning making a full-time move to the edge. And then you've obviously got Cooper and you've got some other guys that round out this roster. That's like, Who's going to actually end yeah. up playing? And so I think that opens the door for Nick Benito to go out there because he is in the Broncos long-term plans. Baron Browning, he's got three years left on his rookie deal. And you look at other guys on this, on this roster and you're wondering, man, like how do, how do certain players fit in and, and what are the Broncos going to do to try to highlight what Nick Benito can bring to the table and they've got to get him out there on the field. So I'm fascinated to see, and maybe here is he getting reps with the first team over a guy like Malik Reed, who's supposed to be out there as the starter quote unquote, without either Bradley Chubb or Randy Gregory on the field. That's going to be an interesting one to follow too. You know, I think for what we've talked about on previous episode here, the show, like which one of these pass rushers can amplify their trade, you know, potential there. And it's not going to be Baron Browning, not going to be Nick Benito. You can make the argument on Bradley Chubb, but it doesn't seem like something the Broncos would do. It'd be, you know, before the trade deadline here. I think that Bradley Chubb will play out this season in Denver, which makes Malik Reed. I think everyone's prime candidate, I think, that is going to be traded in the preseason as George Payton looks to get more draft capital. And that's not an indictment on Malik Reed. That's actually, I think, high praise for what he's been able to do. Like, and pass rushers in the NFL are hard to come by, sir. And as we've talked about here on the show, Malik Reed has stepped up and has done a really good job for Denver. He could potentially be one of those pieces, maybe a connection to Minnesota potentially if they need an edge rusher there but you know some of George Payton's guys in that building are no longer there so we'll see how that kind of formulates but I can't help but think that in the regular season if everything goes maybe how I envision it may go with the edge rusher position I imagine we're going to see a lot kind of like the Super Bowl 50 defense right in terms of when they had Von Miller and DeMarcus Ware as the key starters they would send them on a majority of the plays and then they would switch both those guys out. Like both those guys would come off the field, which is kind of scary. Like as a D coordinator, it's like you really want to take two of your best pass rushers off the field, but you can maybe replace them with guys who are a little bit faster or have like the speed element to them. Guys like Nick Benito guys also on the other side, like Baron Browning. Like I imagine those two guys will be on the field together a ton this season in certain situational packages while maybe Gregory and Chubb do get the start here for the Broncos. But yeah, I mean, I agree. I think it wouldn't hurt for Benito to get reps with the first team because then he can see maybe how he fits in on the defense, how he can play off of the guy next to him, how he can play off the guys behind him. And that's something even Malik Reed has said this offseason. Like for me, he said, one thing I learned last year is at my position, I have to know what the guy behind me is doing. I have to understand where everybody else is moving on this defense to know where I need to be at times. And it was a very complex defense. I don't think the Broncos defense this season is going to be as complex. I'll talk to some players and ask if that's the case, but we'll see how things go here. I wouldn't be shocked that the Broncos utilize that approach. They're having obviously your one a guys being Gregory and Chubb and your one B guys being Benito and Browning together. They can find a way to come with some really clever nickname for it as well. But these are some of the storylines that we're looking forward to. 
beginning today, mandatory mini camp all throughout Wednesday. And then the players are off for about five weeks and then are back for training camp where these storylines will still be very, very relevant. Broncos country, let us know what you're looking forward to seeing throughout mandatory mini camp leading up to training camp and through training camp leading up to the preseason in the comment section down below on YouTube or tweet us on Twitter at Cody Rourke in a film at Sarah Benninger at Lockdown Broncos. But that'll wrap up today's episode of the show. Broncos country, stay tuned. Tomorrow we're going to have a complete recap of day one of mandatory mini camp. Some of the storylines coming out of there as the Broncos prepare for training camp. You get that much more tomorrow's brand new episode, Lockdown Broncos.